So without further nonsense, please help me welcome Chuck Mossy on the stage. Vince, thanks for this light, but Jesus, it's like it's like HD. You get every wrinkly detail. Well, that picture you had on there was that from high school? Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's yeah. cute. It was from about 30 pounds ago and two years ago, though. Yeah, That's how old that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I okay. Why don't you just give a brief background of what you do now with Hawaii and the company and everything that you, your day to day is like now? Well. Like Todd was talking about how he is a uh, workaholic, which I don't believe in that. I mean, yeah. I enjoy what I do. Yeah. You know, you, you talk to Kobe. I mean, he's a basketball-holic. Yeah. No, he's good at what he does, yeah. and he does it. So same thing with I do. I mean, I build houses. I physically build houses in Hawaii because I enjoy doing it. And it's kind of funny because people will talk, Dude, there's a lot of work. Well, why, why do you work so hard? You don't have to. And it's funny because trying to explain that to people – you have to really like go back to their childhood to explain the concept. So I asked him, I said, you know, did you ever build a clubhouse when you were a kid? Well, yeah. Did you ever build bike jumps in the middle of a field? Yeah. Did anybody pay you to do that? No. Well, why the hell did you do it? Well, it was fun. I was hanging out with my buddies. And I said, well, that's why I build houses. It's fun. I'm hanging out with my buddies. <laughs> so that's what I do. I build houses from the ground up. I mean, there's only a couple of things I don't do. I don't do the dozer work. I don't do the concrete. But other than that, we do everything. You know me? I used to take a couple of my, boy, my sons with me. And they kind of said, ah, I'm done with that. I'm going to go do my own thing. And you now my youngest son, he wants to go out there and, and learn about building houses. They weren't real estate holics. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, the weed abatement business was kind of an interesting story because, like you said, you know, buying real estate with no money down um, or buying real estate with no money down and putting cash in your pocket was something I learned buying a car. When I was like 21 years old, I did this with a, with a vehicle, and I thought, well, I wonder if I can buy a house this way. And about, I don't know, 10 years later, I actually did it. Bought a house with no money down and put cash in my pocket. What year was that? God, the first one, I want to say it was in 94. And then I bought an apartment complex, a small unit, five-unit apartment complex. Same thing, no money down, and cash flowed. And then that was a diamond in the rough because you sold that one. Yeah. Oh, that was that was the Victorville. <laughs> Victorville, one? yeah. Oh, we're Apple Valley. Paid wow. one hundred one thousand, and nine years later, after cash flowing almost seventy five thousand dollars, he sells it for five hundred fifty. <laughs> <laughs> that that it that still blew my mind that at the peak of the market, that guy ten thirty one to that five one bedrooms in Apple Valley or Victorville, wherever it was, Apple for five hundred fifty thousand dollars. With tenants that weren't superb. Well, and they were low rent tenants too because I was only collecting about 55% of the going rent yeah. because I didn't want a turnover. And I never bought it for appreciation. I always bought it for cash flow. So if it made money, I didn't care if it appreciated or not. Yeah. And that's all I ever bought real estate that way. So I never wanted a turnover in tenants. So I always kept the rent low so they wouldn't leave. So as rents would go up in the area, I'd leave the rent the same and raise it 10, 20 bucks, no big deal. I mean, as it was, I think the highest rent was Jack. Yeah, on a fixed income. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, paying like 300 bucks a month for a one bedroom apartment. Yeah. That at the time, rent was going for almost 600. But yeah, I didn't care. Yeah, I penciled. And then at the same time, the one you sold in Riverside on Citadel. Yeah. You know, I oh, bought, yeah. I, yeah, I bought that one for like 120,000, put like $5,000 into it, and you ended up selling it for like 350, that same year. Yeah, and that was like a 900 square foot three bedroom house. Made into a three bedroom. <laughs> 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 so okay, so I, your family's real estate. Your your mom. My mom. Your mom's a rental person. Y yeah. Right. So yeah, but she never taught it. No, but she she already did it. She did it. Yeah. Yeah, I know we talked about like how your mom don't do real estate the same way. Yeah, no, no. She's old school, you know, raise up 20%, put it down, fix it up, rent it out. Yeah, yeah. just straight old. So, yeah, um, yeah, because we've talked about buying money, for, or borrowing money from your mom right. for deals and that, well, that whole mess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, so you bought your first deal. Did you, the one you bought in 94, mm -hmm. did you do that? Through Ed Hoffman, when you, was that the first one? That no. You buy that? How'd you do that one? No, that one there was it was an owner carry. Okay. And uh, that one was was through a lady who inherited a house. Um, she did a lot of fix up on it. She wanted to sell it. She was like seventy years old, and I was just twenty five, and she wanted to be a sweetheart to me and be grandma. Sweet. And she says, "Well, you know, I'll take three hundred dollars a month, 
and you pay it off and it's yours. Okay. So I buy for $300 a month, turn around and rent it for $650 a month, and I cash flow on that one. So it was no money down. Yeah. And just paid $300 a month on it. Okay, so there was a time. When did you start buying with the. First of all, how did you learn the option strategy, and when did you start buying with that? Okay. In buying a car, and this was back in 1991, I was dating this girl who worked at Stater Brothers. I mean, I, I grew up dirt poor. I was poor growing up. You, you still look poor. I am poor. Yeah, I'm still poor. <laughs> well, I look poor, but it's kind of funny. Yeah, whatever. It, I, I, I know, it's funny. Because I, I don't care. No, I, okay, hold on. I'm going to interrupt you. We were, one, we were out in front of, one time I, I took Billy with me. Bill, sorry, he's, he's my childhood friend, so I still call him Billy. To, I had to meet up with Chuck somewhere, and we're in front of a, a Home Depot, and I pull up, and, and I'm driving, mind you, I'm driving my like brand new F-150 that, that Chuck had told me that I had too much overhead and we couldn't work together because my overhead was too high. And he's in his 400,000 mile 1990 90, or, or 80s, 1990. 1990 pickup, and, you know, running a tractor all day, hair is all disheveled, sweating, and Billy goes, that's Chuck? And I'm just like, yeah, that's Chuck. He's like, man, he doesn't look like he owns a bunch of property. And I'm like, no, no, he doesn't. And, I, and to this day, <laughs> when we're raising money doing projects, I'm like, man, eh, people's looks and whatever they do doesn't mean anything. No, yeah. Because they, sp- they don't want to spend all their money, don't own shit. Well, it, but it's not even that, though. This is what's really funny about things, because I never got caught up into buying toys at retail. I even bought real estate at retail, so I had to buy toys at retail. And it was so funny, because during the latter part of the 2000s, well, first of all, in the early 2000s, that's when real estate was just going off the hook. I stopped buying real estate in 2002 because I couldn't cash flow. My mindset yeah. was cash flow. And all these other investors are buying it because they were going to flip it later on. It's like, no, 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 I, I don't flip. If I can't make that monthly payment off the rent, I don't want it. It's no interest to me. You're speculating. I remember that phrase. Right. Yeah. And, and so I ended up buying with a partner like 12 properties with Rory. Okay. And all those properties we bought were no money down, cash in our pocket, cash flowed on a monthly basis. And then all of a sudden, this crazy thing starts happening in 2002 where real estate's edging up. 2003, edging up. 2004, it's like, holy sh, what's going on? And I already had a bunch of real estate already, so we're talking about it. He goes, you know what, dude, just just sell this real estate. We'll cash out and go play. I remember that, yeah. And it's like, well, okay, well, whatever. So we cash out, and we had properties that we paid like $40,000 for and sold for like two fifty. dollars That cash flow, $300 a month for three, four years. Huge, yeah, huge mistake. Yeah. We I mean, had we, to, we sold, we we sold early, to, yeah, yeah. which was fine. It didn't matter to me. What do I care? Yeah. I made a ton of money. Yeah. I mean, he ended up making almost $900,000 for doing nothing. Yeah. I made almost $900,000 for doing very little. Yeah. And then I got bored, so I went to Hawaii yeah. and started buying real estate in Hawaii, like gangbusters. And here it is, like you said, you know, 10 years later, I'm still in Hawaii. But it humbled me a lot about economics because I kind of got in a mindset that, you know, California rat race and born and raised Californian, if you're in business and you do business, it's always a race. You're always trying to outrun the next mouse. Yeah. And you're always trying to outmaneuver. And I think that Hawaii was probably one of the greatest health things for me. Because okay. I probably would have had a heart attack just from just run, 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 yeah, run, run, run. Yeah, three companies. Oh, yeah. And the thing, the oh, yeah. Thing's a mess. But see, it's just like that. You know, buying real estate with no money down. I actually bought the company with no money. I actually had yeah. one of the partners pay yeah. me to buy the company. That was, that was an, <laughs> while, while you're working at Stater Brothers. While working at Stater Brothers. Yeah. He comes up to me and he wants to say, hey, man, buy me out of my company. I can't do it no more. And it's like, okay, well, why would I want your company? He goes, well, check it out. And so basically, he took it from you know under a hundred thousand to within seven years made over a million dollars a year in the in the company, and it was a company that had been in business already fourteen years, and I did in six years and, and built it up and wasn't even doing anything. I got bored with a bunch of money. Well, you always say I wasn't doing anything, but I've seen your work schedule, and I've and I and I text you, and he's like, I'm on a tractor or whatever he's doing, and it's it's something physical. Oh, I'm put hanging drywall here. 
It's built in a clubhouse. Well, yeah, it's built in a clubhouse. Yeah. So, so I, you know, it, again, it's, it's whatever you and, – and it's kind of funny because I'm almost 50 years old. I mean, I'll be 50 at the end of this year. Yeah. And it's so funny. Working at Stater Brothers, there's guys that were 40 years old that looked like they were 70. Yeah. Why? Because they hated the job. Yeah. And it's like, why are you here? Because I have to. Not here. Not in America. You can do anything you want. Why are you here? And they just age and age yeah. and age and age and age. And, and it's just so funny because most people that economically don't have to physically work turn into what we call a big tub of goo. Well, they're waiting they to die. do anything. Yeah, they're just waiting to die. The, the, yeah. So yeah. it's like, why? So, so to ask the question, you know, why do I do what I do? Because I enjoy it. I have fun doing it. It's a blast. So because I interrupted myself, <clears throat> let's go back to the option thing. Because yeah. that changed my – because I was so young and so pliable, that changed the entire way I looked at buying real estate. So, how the hell did that happen? Okay. Well, part of it, though, for you, when, when you first approached me with it, because, you know, you started having these deals, like, oh, wow, you know, you're pretty ambitious and, and trying to work on some stuff. And I remember telling you, dude, don't let money lose the deal. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, huh? And it's like, yeah. don't let money lose the deal. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? Well, dude, if you can't find the money, you're going to lose the deal, right? Well, yeah. Okay, well, don't let that happen. Yeah. Well, what am I going to do? And I said, show me the deal. Yeah. And, again, being a, you're a novice thinking that all these things were going to cost this astronomical price yeah. at a contractor's rate. And I look at it going, no, 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 dude, this is sweat equity. You yeah. know, if you're willing to get a little dirty and sweat a little bit, then you can really make some money at, here, at this. And then I think that deal you thought it was going to cost like $70,000 of rehab. It's like over fifty grand, and it ended up being like 24000 and like Right, and, and, and yeah. I look at it, I'm going, dude, if you spend more than $25,000, there's yeah. something wrong. Yeah. And, and, and it was a full-on gut out the house and redo it. And like, like, just gross. Oh, yeah. Gross. Oh, yeah, it was dirty. But, yeah. th again, you know, it's like walking in, do you smell that? Yeah, it smells like, it smells like money. Yeah, and but, it's money. But, you, but I mean, long before, like, it, it smelled like shit. <laughs> like, just straight up, just just wall-to-wall -wall animal crap covered in newspaper. But, I mean, long before that, when you were, okay, well, you gave me specific terms to use mm -hmm. that you had been using for years. Yes. Which was the, and you were using, this doesn't exist anymore, but 95% ARM. Loan to Or 95% LTV non occupied loans. Correct. And refine those based on current value. Re well, and so that, was, that was the biggest difference right there is because everything that we negotiated in buying is I never, if, if I went up to somebody and, and, and they had a house for sale, and we'll just use just basic numbers for sake of, 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 of conversation. So I go up to you and, and you're selling your house and you want 100,000 for the house. I need to know why you want to sell the house. Yeah. I want to know why are you selling and it's like whatever, I don't like this neighborhood, I want out. And this was in the 90s where you had people who got caught up on the last bubble yeah. from, the, from the late 80s into the 90s. And so I come up asking you, what are you gonna do? Well, I'm moving out of this area, I'm going to another city, whatever. Great, because I need to know how motivated you are to sell because that will determine how motivated you are to negotiate. So in looking at the house, the house is lived in. These are people that lived in their house, you know, 10, 15 years and they want out. So I don't bash the house, but I'll make the obvious comments like, you gotta paint the walls, need a new roof, need some landscaping, need cabinet, whatever it is. And the whole time I want them doing this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so, you know, that. to do this, you know, it's going to cost money, right? Of course it is. Yeah, obviously. Okay, but, you know, I'm going to give you numbers, and, and these numbers are not going to be outlandish numbers. Okay. Like, you know, replacing the carpet is going to cost about 2500 bucks. And that seems reasonable. You know, and now i got to paint the house, and yeah, that's going to cost about I mean, $1,500. Yeah. Been here a while. My wife wanted me to do that for a while. Yeah, no, I understand. You know, the roof, you know, yeah. it gets kind of expensive. Yeah, well, you know, it's an old house. Well, there you go. So now I, I take this $100,000 house and I negotiate him down to $85,000. That's a $15,000 difference. Yeah. But off the bat, right from the beginning, I'm going to say, I'm an investor. I'm not going to live here. Yep. You okay with that? Yep, of course. Okay. I'm going to come in and fix up the house and I'm going to rent it out. I have no intent to live here. So just so we're crystal clear, I'm an investor. I just, I just don't want to live here anymore. Okay, great. And that's what I want to hear. You know, it's usually not him not wanting to live there as much as his wife. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. live here no more. My wife's been it. complaining about this neighborhood for years. 
So now I say, okay, so here we are. We're agreeing to $85,000, right? Yes. Okay, and I already told you I'm an investor, right? Yes. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to do a lease option to buy in the house. What's the lease option to buy? Well, that, what that does, that allows us to go into contracts. It's going to be an escrow and everything's secured. Okay. And I'm going to be able to come into the house and I'm going to fix it up. This is all legal. It's all legal. Okay. There's, there's, you're, you're in the up and up on everything that's going on. Okay, we're good. Now, you have a current mortgage? Yes. And, and your monthly payment? Uh, it's about six fifty. Okay. Well, we're going to make that monthly payment until the most powerful word until. in the English language, <laughs> until. How much time do you have with until? Forever. There you go. The most powerful word in a contract is until. So, I will make your house payment okay. until I get financing. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll make payment to an escrow company so that you know I'm making the payment and I know the payment's being made. Yeah, my wife would be better off with that. There She'd you go. She'd be okay with that. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is we're going to go in this lease option to buy. I'm going to purchase a property after I fix it up at appraised value. Okay. Now, you're going to get your $85,000 and go your happy merry way wherever you want to go minus whatever mortgage you okay, have. Okay, so I'm still going to get the eighty five. dollars You get your eighty five thousand. Okay. That's all I care about. That's all you care about. Yeah. So now I'd go in and I'd fix up the house and the house would appraise at $110,000. So my purchase price for this property is $110,000. Okay. But I'm only paying $85,000 to you. You're going to walk away. Well, I don't care what you do on the other side. That's the bank. That's right. And that's a $25,000 spread. Yep. Okay. So now at the time, the glorious days of 95% yeah. LTVs, I get it fixed up. I get it appraised. It appraised for $110,000. Sweet. So a 95% LTV gives me about $102,000, $103,000. I'm only paying eighty five for it, yep. and I'm only going to put in about five thousand dollars worth of fix up in it. Yeah, so I got ninety thousand dollars tied to this property, and I'm going to get a loan for one hundred three thousand. A nice chunk of cash up front covers your rent vacancies and whatever. And then turn around and rent it. And I would do these turnarounds from the time we negotiate and go into contract, and you sign that paper. Yep. I would have a tenant in that property within three weeks. Now, I remember you said the most important thing with with. The deal we did, and with all these deals, you said the people have to move. Yes. Because you've got to get the work done. Yes. It was every time. Like, they understood in that negotiation that they were going to move out within a certain period of time upon the contract. Correct. Now, all of this still works today. Yes. It's just slightly different. Yes. Have you looked at it today? No, it because I'm so busy with Hawaii. I know. I, know you so I, I haven't really invested in any real estate. I've just been building it and selling it. So the exact thing still works exactly the same today, only you just have to wait six months to cash out. That's it. You just have to wait six months. Um, you change your numbers a little bit. You can't be as tight as that. Um, but when the prices are higher, it tends to be a little easier to do. I'm, so there were a couple of key phrases in that contract, other than until. that The whole Joe Canale story that goes with that is amazing. Right. But there were a couple key phrases. Well, one of the biggest things is that People would tend to get nervous with this idea of this lease option by contract. And the, one of the biggest clauses in it that I would clarify to the seller in clarity, bold print, that would say, in the event you cancel escrow, yeah. you pay me my contractor's rate price for all the work I did to the house. And guess what? It's expensive. It's expensive. If, on the other hand, I cancel escrow for whatever reason, you get a house fixed up and I walk away. So it's a win-win, but it's more of a tie that yeah. you want out, and that's the motivating part that I want them to leave. Yeah. Now, once they, walk, once they sign that and walk out of the house, it's done. We're moving forward. Now, there's only other one other clause. If you're in here and you have a license, um, you have to state that you're an agent. You're buying the property below market value. The seller understands they are selling that property below market value due to condition or circumstance or whatever the case may be. It has to be fully disclosed. Neither of us are lawyers. This isn't legal advice. Still talk to your attorney. But the phrases should sound something to that effect. Right, and you're protected, and they're protected. And the biggest thing is that everything's above board. You're not trying to finagle anybody. You're not trying to hustle anybody. You're just, tr basically, I'm a problem solver. You got a problem, which means your wife wants you out, yep. and I'm going to solve that problem for you. And I'm going to make some money in the process that will not cost you anything. Yeah. It's not costing you no money to get out. I've bought houses. And it's kind of interesting, too, because we're going to Stater Brothers. The late 90s, people were walking away from their house. They were saying, you know, they just mail the, mail the keys back to the bank. 
And I had uh, a coworker who, her husband was a butcher, and she was a clerk. So they made really good money. And we're having this conversation, and she's like, yeah, you know, we're going to buy a new house out in Nuevo. We got this house in Marina Valley. I said, well, what are you going to do with the house? Oh, we're going to give it back to the bank. And it's like, right? can I have it? <laughs> she says, do you want it? Yeah. She says, well, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to rent it out. And so I said, well, what is your house payment? She goes, $700 a month. At the time, rent was about seven fifty a month. Okay. And I said, okay, when are you guys leaving? She says, well, we're going to move out, you know, in, in, in two months. And it's like, great. Just let me know when you move out. So I sit down with her husband, and they're worried about their credit, that their credit is just going to get destroyed because they're going to have a foreclosure on their credit. So I sit with them at their table, and we're talking. He goes, why do you want this house? It's got a mortgage of 100000 and it's only worth, like, 87000 okay. And it's like, okay, yeah, but I can rent it out for seven fifty. But it's not worth what's owed on it. Why would you? Buy it. And this is a conversation we were just having right now. You know, it, it's not the price, it's terms. You know? And it's like, all I'm thinking about is I'm making 50 bucks a month. I don't give a shit what it costs. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. The cool thing about it was I told him, I said, I cannot get the loan in my name right now, so it has to stay in your name until I can finance it. Are you True. cool with that? We don't care. We just don't want a foreclosure on our property on our name. Okay, great. So we sit there and he says, Okay, we're ready to move out. What do you want me to do? And I said, well, can you make next month's payment? You're moving out on the 30th. Can you make next month's payment? Sure. You want me to make three payments for you? I go, nah, <laughs> nah. You know, I don't think it's a dude. I'm like 50 bucks a month. No, 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 no. I'm already going to make 700 bucks, you know, because you're going to pay the, the sure. payment. So he makes the house payment. They move out. Within seven days, I get it all renovated, painted, everything else. On the 14th day, I have a tenant in there. Wow. <laughs> And I rent it for seven fifty a month. Sweet. Now, f four years go by, okay. and they're like, hey, Chuck, are you ever going to refinance this house? And this is all in a handshake, just a handshake. No contract, no nothing, all a handshake. Okay. So it's like, you know what? I need to get this thing refied. And they said, okay, well, you know, do what you got to do. So I ended up going to Wholesale Capital, okay. and I ended up getting a loan for $170,000 on it. Sweet. No money down. Yeah. Cash flowed. By that time, rent got up to like... Eight seventy-five. Okay. So I'm, you know, I'm making money. Yeah. Then I got the refi, and it was low. You know, the the the, the rate on it was eh, was a so-so. Yeah. But it didn't matter to me because it didn't cost me nothing to get this property. Yeah. And I still own it today. I mean, uh, most of I mean, I own my first house still that yeah, I bought. That's true. You know, when I was 20 years old, I bought my first home. I still own it today. It's been paid off for like, gosh, 15 years. Was that a mobile or a house? Mobile home mobile, on, yeah. on land. Because that was your first ones were mobiles. First one was mobile. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because when I first did mobiles, I only bought them on land. I wasn't going to buy them in parks yeah. because if you don't own the land, then all you're doing is going to be able to rent the rest of your life on it. Yeah. So I'd buy mobile homes on land in communities. And it was kind of funny because I was buying these mobile homes for like $30,000. And I could rent them out for 700 bucks. where you can buy a house in Marino Valley for like $70,000 and you can rent it out for... 800 bucks. Yeah, that's like cash flow. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. You learned a lot about the mobile home parts catalogs. I learned time. a lot about it. Well, I learned how to make things work. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, that, that one particular property we talked about where the lady said $300 a month. Yeah. I actually, t I was so poor, I made baseboard out of particle board. <laughs> I mean, I was just taking on a router and start routing it out because I had more time than money. Sweet. So, you know, and, it, and it's one of those things that, you know, you, you get really innovative and, and learn how to make things work and make things look richer than they actually are. You know, Cottonwood. Yeah. Another story in Marina Valley. Um, that thing's a real interesting piece <laughs> of property. No, like no one, no one here wants this place. Yeah. No. This is, this is a duplex that you couldn't see from the street on two acres of land in Marina Valley. Yeah. And the, the neighbor of the property is a friend of mine, and the other neighbor is where they used to park the tractors at. God, he's, so, he's probably still cursing you for oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I find out about this property. He says, hey, he says, you know, the owner passed away. The kids have it. They're in their 60s. They're going to sell it. And I, what do they want for it? And he goes, they want 85000 And I said, oh, great. I said, how about I buy it for appraised value? And the funny thing about it is, is most people will sit there and actually write everything I say and still question, how did you do this deal? And it's like, you wrote it down. Were you not paying attention? 
So th- I, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. So, anyways, so we get this property, and this is where the word "until" kept this property in escrow for 13 months because I could not get financing because I had so many other projects going okay. on. So he tells me, he says, he says, listen, they want $85,000. They're going to give you $10,000 to demo it. And I said, demo it? Great. Let's go check it out. And it was a mess. And I walk in. I said, okay, they're going to give me $10,000 to demo it, right? He goes, yeah. And I said, oh, well, great. We're going to fix it up. And he goes, why? Why not? Was, was that Glenn at the time? Glenn, was it Glenn Wagner that was doing the demo at the time still? Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, still yeah, there. yeah, yeah. He's a Marina, not a Marina Valley Yeah, anymore. yeah, he's retired. There's a guy who like, used to love demoing houses. He was a building inspector. Yeah. So I go in and I fix up this house, which, you know, Frank was like amazed that. Fix up. Yeah. It had wood siding. None of the windows fit. I had to put new, not new windows, but I had to put windows in it just yeah. to get it going. It had plywood siding on it. So in order to get financing, again, getting creative, I had to make it look like stucco. So I took a stucco. It, it, just the sand and stuck it in a hopper and just, just shot it, it. <laughs> and it looked like stucco. In fact, they even did the appraisal saying stuccoed house. Uh, okay. okay, cool. Thirteen months later, it appraised for one hundred eighty thousand wow. dollars, and I said, well, "Hey, Frank, will they, you know, do it for that?" Dude, they're ready to cancel escrow. I said, "All right, well then we're just gonna do it for the one hundred five thousand. I'll just move forward." So here it was. I buy a property that was cash flowing almost a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. And had over seventy thousand dollars worth of equity, and I put no money down on it. You still have Cottonwood, right? You no, still I still have Cottonwood. Yeah. yeah, and there's still Section Eight tenants. No, do you no, kind of got away from that because how, it yes, became too much are? drama. Oh, do you still have all? You got rid of all your Section Eight tenants? Pretty much. I think we might have one, and she's like this little old lady. Okay. That that is like okay, well. Because you know. had like forty something Section Eight tenants. No, no, no. Forty no, no. seven tenants. I had, I, had, I had forty. We had forty three rentals at one time. Okay. And then, um, then basically started selling off some of the stuff, and then that's when I ended up going to Hawaii. Okay, yeah. so, so y- you have some gnarly Section Eight stories that can probably get pretty hairy. I don't want to go into two of them because yeah. cr- your 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 twelve page rental contract alone is yeah. a byproduct of that. Mm-hmm. Um, any warnings for people working with Section Eight tenants? You know. Here's one of the biggest problems that people have when, it, when they come to being property managers. And, and it's kind of funny because my first rental contract back in 1988 was an eight and a half by 11 sheet. Today, <laughs> it's 12 pages, eight and a half by 14. And I make them initial just enormous amounts of things on everything that, that's pertinent on yeah. it. Because we ran into everything from... Uh, you know, um, burglaries to insurance issues to spousal abuse issues to just just a barrage of things. And, you know, they want you to be accountable. It's like, I don't live there. Yeah. Well, you own the house. I don't live there. So I can't be responsible for your actions or your spouse's actions or anybody else's actions. But the biggest challenge that most landlords run into is they don't do their homework. See, if I have a, a potential tenant, I don't call their references because what do you think they're going to tell me? Yeah. Oh, he's great. Take them. Yeah. I'm not going to talk to their current landlord. Why? Why are you moving? Yeah. So the best thing you could do on a tenant is show up at their house unannounced. When you walk up to the front door, look at the flower beds. If there's cigarette butts there, guess what your house is going to look like? Then, once you get to the front door, and they're, oh, what are you doing here? Oh, you know, I, I need a signature on this before I can do X, Y, Z. You know, man, I just drank a soda. Can I use the bathroom? Well, it's a mess. <laughs> That's okay. You've got kids. I understand. The thing about it is, if you walk into a house and there's clothes all over the place, no problem. Dishes all over the kitchen, no problem. Laundry everywhere, no problem. That's lived in. Toys all over. The, that's lived in. But when you walk in and see a stack of pizza boxes and cans of beer empty all over the place, that's yeah, what your bro. house is going to look like. Yep. Cigarette burns in the carpet, that's what your house is going to look like. And a lot of people don't understand that. It's like, why are you calling their reference? Show up at their house unannounced. Yeah. And then get in the house. Yeah, and look at their car when they pull up. Look at, look at the way they live. Oh, yeah. And that's, and that's one of the biggest things. If you get inside the house, you're going to see what your house is going to look like. Especially if they've been there some years. There you go. So uh, can we talk about 
how you got to Hawaii? Interesting. I got mean, to Hawaii. Is that? I mean, can we, can we talk about Ron and that kind of that whole mess or like? Well, that was that wasn't part of going to Hawaii. Going to Hawaii was Jeff. Was Jeff? Yeah. What happened was, um, <clears throat> this was interesting. In 2001. Just to give you a little background, in 2001, I'm working at Stater Brothers part-time, stock crew. Yeah. I have a lawn business that I started for a friend who I got stiff with, Fernando. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I bought this weed abatement company. Well, I got paid to buy this weed abatement company, <laughs> <coughs> which is really a fun. I'll, t I'll tell a story. We got time for yeah, it. Yeah, we got time. <coughs> um, and at the same time, I bought 10 houses in 2001. Okay. And all of them, no money down. I rehabbed them physically myself and got them rented out. And the, the, that whole year was a blur. Yeah. I slept maybe four hours a day, and that wasn't all at one time. It was usually 20 minutes on the check stand at Stater <laughs> that night and you know, two or three hours here and there, but it was always go, 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 go. And it was kind of interesting because my whole idea of investing in real estate was to have freedom. That was my goal. See, most people, as, as you know, young kids getting out of high school, what's your goal? I'm gonna be retired at 30. Yeah. You know, and everybody talked about being retired at 30. It's like, what does that mean? Then what? What do you do? You know, well, that was the thing. For me, it was always I want to be able to retire by 30, but I'm not going to because there's still years of life left. So I was able to retire at 28. I had rental properties that were cash flowing like crazy, and then I did like most people did, started helping family, and got into just a mess <laughs> and got behind on my plan because of helping family. But that whole, con that, that whole year, was, like I said, was a blur. Well, then the partner that I had, who was more of an anchor than a partner, um, I stopped buying real estate with him, and that's when we decided to sell the real estate. Yeah. And he ended up basically kind of just going to the wayside and then finally ended up buying him out of the company. Yeah, he bought out, moved. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just to give you an idea of the company, in 1988, or I'm sorry, 1998, the one partner I bought out, they had three tractors, and I bought them out for $65,000. In 2006, I bought the second partner out. We had like 10 tractors and a yard and trucks and everything else, and I bought him out for $850,000. And he did nothing to build the company, yeah. which was kind of amazing. But when we sold all the real estate, we paid off the company, all our tractors and equipment and everything else. So it was a debt-free company. And he had a chunk of money, I had a chunk of money, and Jeff Signorelli from Wholesale Capital, yeah. we're talking story, and he says, hey, he says, you ever thought about going to Hawaii? And it's like, for what, vacation? He goes, no, to invest. And I'm going, dude, there's no freaking way. Hawaii's expensive. And he yeah. goes, that's what everybody thinks. And it's like. Turns out it's not at all. Yeah, and he goes, go to the big island. He goes, you can buy you know, acre of land for like 40 grand. And it's like, bullshit. He goes, yeah. no, yeah. I go, leasehold? He goes, no, fee simple. I said, when are you going again? Well, I'm going in two months. Well, can I tag along? Sure. So I tagged along, and this was in uh, 2005. And I look at it, at the property. I look at the, 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 the packaged homes that they were selling as far as kits that you could build. It's like Sears Homes. Yeah, yeah, but you build it. And that's the funny yeah. thing about it is most people think a kit home is actually like a kit. You just erect it like a puzzle. But yeah. it's not. It's still... You know, two by fours and nails yeah. and, and, and windows and everything else. You got you to gotta assemble from, from nothing. Um, <clears throat> so I look at this. I talk with the realtor. And within six months, I bought 18 lot, 18 one-acre lots, got my contractor's license, got my plumbing license, got my electrical license. And then three months later, actually partially moved to Hawaii and started building houses because I was... Cause why not? Bored. Yeah, then you sucked me into that. Then I, <laughs> I show up, and I'm like, what the hell's going on? And I remember, I remember leaving going, I don't know how I was going to do it, but it's going to be interesting. <laughs> and we left, and we tried selling stuff on eBay. Yeah. That was interesting. You can sell real estate on eBay, by the way, and it's international, in case you ever have anything to sell to international clients. Well, and Craigslist was a big thing back then, yeah. starting up. So yeah. Craigslist was a big thing for selling real estate. Um, and it, the islands is a whole different world. Yeah. You know, they, it, 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 most people, when they ask me, are you back in the country? And it's like, I never left. Well, yeah, you went to Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> did you not study geography in high school or something? Oh, I don't understand. No, no, just, I'm, I'm just back on the mainland. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. back on the mainland. But, but that's what's really funny, though. But, you know, they, they, they talk about that, that Hawaii 
is the United States, but it's not America. It's not. It's not. And the, the culture, it's, it's really funny because I, had, I acclimated really quick to the culture yeah. to be able to communicate with people because I studied personal communications for about 15 years on how to communicate with people. And the biggest thing was gaining rapport as quickly as possible with them. And so on the islands, you can talk to people and you're like, what did you say? Yeah. And they say it the same way. And they say, I'm sorry, can you say that again? And they'll say it the same way. And it's like, dude, I didn't get it three times. Can you change <laughs> how you're saying this? Because I don't get what you're saying. And it's because they speak pigeon, you know? And, and, it, and it's really funny. Because after a while, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just pick up the dialect and all of a sudden, bro, how long you been here? Oh, right. like six months. Oh, no, bro, you been here longer than that. <laughs> like, yeah, whatever. But, it, you know, it's gaining rapport with people. Yeah. And, and that creates a lot of avenues of, of um, being able to work with different people. And, and, and I've done it on everything. I mean, it, it, I've been to New Orleans, you know, where they say, don't walk around here at night. And it's like, yeah. why not? Dude, you're going to get mugged. Well, then act like they do. Walk around with food in your hand and nobody's going to bother you. Yeah. You know, you look like a local, they're going to treat if you like a local. you're in the middle of the street buying tacos or whatever in the middle of New Orleans, you're fine. Exactly. Fried, it's exactly. just tacos, fried, whatever. Exactly. So <coughs> when, you, when you first went to Hawaii, you had Rob, contractor? What was the name of the contractor, Rob? Was that his name? He wasn't a contractor. He was just a worker. A worker. So, yeah. Okay. So it's been a decade now. Yeah. So talk about what that was like when you first had Rob building the first first couple homes, and then what the plan is now building Hawaii. Well, <sighs> what had to happen, I guess. Yeah, one of the biggest things is that okay, you walk on the island, you're a howly. Yeah. You're an outsider. Flip floppy tan. Yeah, yeah, sure yeah. Tan, well, and I still got it after ten years. I still yeah. got flip floppy tan because I don't, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm just not hanging out at the beaches. The funny thing about it is on the Big Island, there's a lot of tradition still there on the Big Island. And the funny thing about the tradition of it, there's a lot of Japanese on the island. And a lot of the Japanese control the government in Hawaii. And a lot of Hawaiians are coming from the perspective of entitlement. You know, oh, you freaking hollies, come over here, yeah. take our land. Yeah. And now, shoes, probably. We should build for the nothing. people. Build for the people here. Yeah, well, yeah. get off and help. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Just give you an example about this guy, Rob, that he's talking about. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a wild story. <clears throat> I meet this guy through his wife from the place that I buy the lumber from. And she's like, well, you know, Chuck, if you're going to be over here, you got to hire locals. You cannot just be bringing people from the mainland. It's like, okay, any idea who I can hire? Yes. <laughs> My husband. And it's like, okay. So he comes in and he's helping. Guy shows up at 8 o'clock, takes 15 minutes to put his boots on, takes another 15 minutes to get ready to put his nail bag on. Now this is a guy that's probably five foot seven, tall and probably around. Yeah, he's a big boy. He's probably pushing three hundred pounds, and gets started on working. Then about ten o'clock, you know, it's time for break time. You know, time for grinds. <laughs> and then about eleven thirty, it's time for lunch. Oh, bro, I got time for grinds. It's like okay, grinds. Two o'clock, pow. What's pow? Pow. Okay, I'll ask you again. Yeah. What's pow? Uh, we're done for the day. Yeah. Dude, it's 2 o'clock. And these are guys that are juicing me for 30 bucks an hour cash. Okay? Because they don't get on the payroll. <laughs> no, they don't. Yeah. So I'm trying. The wife is telling me all these horror stories about you know, mainlanders coming in and raping and pillaging the locals and all this other you stuff. You told me, you're like, we can't hire contractors from outside. It'll yeah. be a big problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and, and I brought in my son and his buddy when I first went over there. And, you know, we were low-key because we're family. And then I got connected with this family, so now I'm a Hanai brother, which is kind of like an adopted brother if okay. they accept you. So, so when they introduce you, they introduce you as a Hanai brother. So I got that title after two years. And so now um, she's telling me she wants to build a house. And I'm going, okay, great. She's, you know, but Chuck, we cannot build a house by ourselves. We need help. And it's like, okay, cool. What, what do you want to do? So she tells me about the specific area where she wants to build, and, and all right, we'll pick the land, and I'll put the down payment, I'll put the loan in my name. You know, I, I got to have some control here. I'm not going to just give you money. And she's like, yeah, 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 no worries, no worries, no worries. Her husband's working for me, and, you know, he's making money and everything else. And so we buy this land for $70,000, and I said, as long as you want it, that's all that matters to me. Just pick what you want. Okay, great. Now, this is a woman at the time who was 40 years old. Her husband's 30 years old. They have no kids. They live in a 600-square-foot house. 
They want to build a house. So I'm thinking, okay, 600 square foot now, uh, 12, 1,300 square foot house. Okay, whatever, no big deal. So next thing you know, she's showing me these plans for a 3,200 square <laughs> foot house. <laughs> and I'm like, she's living in Aloha. Sh- brah, for who? <laughs> and I ask her, I'm going, why such a large house? Oh, you know, when, when, the, when, when the kiki come over. And it's like, how often do they come over now? Oh, they don't, but if I have room, they come over. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and the ohana and all this and that. I'm going, okay, whatever. So now we're, we're, we're getting ready to start. We got permits and everything. We're going to start dozing the lot and everything else. So just before we close escrow on the lot, they buy two brand new Dodge full-size crew cab diesel trucks. Ballin'. Yeah, eighty-five thousand dollars worth of trucks, and I'm going. What are you doing? Oh, no worries. And I was like, okay, well, okay, whatever. So we're getting ready to start on this thing, and, and and Rob and I are talking, and I said, Rob, I said, you know, how are we gonna work this out and build in this house? He goes, Oh yeah, I'm thinking about that. So, uh, you still gonna pay me thirty dollars an hour to build a house? And I'm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you buy it for four hundred grand. Wait a minute. You want me to pay you to build your house? I'm already fronting the money to build the house. Bro, I cannot work for free. <laughs> I just went, all right, I'm done. I'm done. So I go back to her. I'm going, Anu, I don't understand. First of all, I don't understand how you're going to build this house, qualify for this house, and pay for these trucks. They had $1,600 worth of truck payments. <sighs> oh, no worries, Chuck. I got to figure it out. And I said, okay, how are you going to figure them out? She said, well, we figured the house is going to cost $170 to build, $70,000 for the lot, I said, okay, so you know we're up to like two fifty. She says, yeah, and the trucks at eighty five thousand. We put that in the loan too. Oh man. I said, okay, so you're guesstimating this house is going to be worth three hundred fifty thousand. She says, yeah. I said, so you're going to get a loan for like three hundred twenty thousand. She says, yeah. Okay, well, who's going to pay the taxes on that eighty five thousand dollars that I don't get? That's paying for your trucks. What you mean? Well, I don't know. When I get a loan, when you get a loan and give me the three hundred twenty thousand, you want that trucks paid off, right? Yeah. Well, Uncle Sam's going to say I made $85,000 yeah. profit. Yeah. Well, who's going to pay the taxes on that? Oh, I didn't think about that. I was like, oh. <laughs> now, mind you, this is a woman who has only been from island to island who honestly believes that the big island is the largest place on earth. Honestly. Yeah. And I find this out after the fact. Yeah. Because she tells me the story that her, hu- her son is going to go to school in, in, uh, he's going to go to Arizona Tech. And I said, great. So when's he moving to the mainland? She goes, oh, he's going to be moving in about six months. I go, where's he moving to? She goes, oh, North Hollywood. I went, Arizona Tech where? <laughs> she was like in Phoenix. And I go, and he's just going to visit? She goes, no, he's going to commute. I go, <laughs> no, he's not. And she goes, yeah, you know, from, from, from Hilo to the volcanoes, that far, it's only 30 miles. <laughs> so from North Hollywood to Phoenix. I go, you know what? I'll tell you what. You saw that on Google? She says, yeah. And I said, okay. Zoom into Hilo. Zoom out. When you see the mainland, tell me if you still see the island. <laughs> what you mean? Do it. Because that's like a nine-hour commute if he's lucky to get out of Los Angeles. <laughs> right. And she honestly believed this. So you had that. That was your contractor mess trying to build. And it took how long to build a home? Well, with at him, time, yeah. it was about six months. Okay, six months to build a home. And then to sell them at the time took like four months to six months. It would depend on the realtor, but oh, yeah. Some took like a year. Oh, yeah, 11 months. There's like season issues. Yeah, and well, then, no, it was realtor issues. And then the cost to build the first home was like two something? Two, uh, 220, including the land. Okay, and so now what's your cost to build? Now to build a house, well, we built a different house, a bigger house. Yeah. Um, the cost to build a house now is running a about, including the land, is running about 230. 230 for yeah. a bigger home. For a big home. And then, so how much was that? The first, how much did the first home sell for, and then now this one? Well, the first house sold for like 270. Okay. And the house we're building now, which is 500 square foot bigger, is selling for like 380. Okay, so much bigger margin over time. Big margin on that, yeah. And then you and you have, how many lots you said you buy originally? Uh, 18 lots. And then now you have how many left? Four. And then you're going to go somewhere else in the island? Yeah, there's another area because, again, the whole local thing that locals are being priced out of the uh, being able to buy a home. So we got this other area that's up above from where I build now, and there's small 8,500 8, square foot lots that you can buy for 10 grand. 
and it's fee simple. You own them. Yeah. And it's on the island. And the thing about it is, is very few people know about it. Well, yeah. very few well, people now, did uh, know about it. Now, like, <laughs> 140 people and wherever this goes on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a small place. Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah, so, so it's trying to help out locals to be able to buy a home because uh, we're talking about building, you know, basic bread and butter, three-bedroom, two-bath homes, yeah. two-car garage on an 8,500-square-foot lot. Um, square footage on the, on the house, like 1,100 square feet that they can buy for like 180000 Okay. Yes, it's good. Yeah, and I, I mean, at an interest rate of like 4%, I mean, the payment's like 800 bucks. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, you can work at Walmart part-time and make that house payment. I mean, it's an upgrade from the tent on the ocean that a lot of locals are living in. <laughs> well, so. no, it's an upgrade from having freaking 11 people in the same house. Yeah, exactly. Which is very big and common over yeah. there because, you know, to most, most people in Hawaii that are Hawaiian or partial Hawaiian or Portuguese or whatever they are that are born and raised there, you know, the house is nothing more than to keep the rain off your head. So, you know, you have some that, that like the status. Yeah. I mean, most of the houses that I sell to, I sell to mainlanders that are retired. Yeah. You know, they're baby boomers that I sell to. And that was my original market. Yeah, that was just my one target. acre lots. Originally. One acre yeah. lots, yeah. you know, 10 minute walk to the ocean. Yeah. You know, you can feel the water. You're not going to play in the water. Yeah. So, yeah, you can see it from the lava cliff. Yeah, that 20 foot cliff. You <laughs> yeah. see the water there. Yeah. So it's a little dip. So we're going to, we're getting to nine. It's getting late. All right. Um, I don't, I don't want to say parting advice, but so lots of people ask me the same question they ask you now. What's that? What should I do? So you, so you, this is your opportunity to give the Well, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because like the conversation we're having over here is most people's mindset on investing is always caught up on numbers. Yeah. And the thing about it is, is price is irrelevant. And I'll give you a scenario. And it is a scenario that I've, I've actually shared with a lot of people. And the age doesn't matter. Just like they talk about employees, yep. you know, this new generation suck, don't want to work. Well, that's funny because I know baby boomers don't freaking want to work either. Yeah. And, and, and all the ages in between that don't want to work. So it isn't a generation. It's just a cultural thing that, that people have gotten fixated in this, you know, um, you know, my dad worked in a warehouse. I shouldn't have to work in one. Why? What did you do not to work in a warehouse? Yeah. Well, I was born. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I, 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 I want to make, you know, that was one of the biggest things that I went through with like the company, the, the weed abatement company. In the early 2000s, we started going into a very bad lack of employ, uh, employee workers, uh -huh. you know, that wanted to work. I mean, I ended up having to hire a bunch of ex-cons because labor force was zero. And they because, hustled. Yeah. And, and, and they, they went into construction. So I ended up with these guys that were the, literally the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. They either got a job or they went back in. And they were not the best of workers. I mean... What takes today, or what took 10 guys to do, I had 40 guys to try and Shit. do. So it's like 40 slugs to do <laughs> the work of 10 people. And, and, and it's changed through technology and everything else. But it was kind of funny because of the boom. And try to educate people on their value and what they're worth. <clears throat> because after 2008, I had a lot of guys who left working for me to go into construction and everything else. And then after the bust, they're coming back for a job. And it's like, okay, dude, well, you, you weren't very good when you left. Yeah. So what kind of pay are you looking at? Well, I was getting 24 bucks an hour. Well, okay, now. great. You know, what were you making before you made 24 bucks an hour? 10? That's about what you're worth. Because if you ain't getting the $24, it's because you're not worth it. Yeah. Well, it's bullshit. No, that's life. It's a cycle. And the funny thing about it is to educate somebody on that is really interesting because you can sit there and tell them, okay, well, you're making $10 an hour, right? And you're living off $10 an hour, right? When you got up to $24 an hour, did you put that $14 an hour away for a rainy day? No. Hell no. I was partying like a rock star. Yeah, living well, up. then there it is. Suck it up. Yep. Because the guy who was making the $24 an hour that you were making was making $38 bucks an hour. Now he's making $24 and he's bitching. Yep. You know? Understand that where you started at is what you're worth. You're only worth as much as what somebody's willing to pay you. And it's much, that pay is based on what you give for it. And most people, they, they think they're worth a lot more than they are. It's like, well, dude, I didn't, I don't have a gun to your head. There's a gate, leave. Yeah. You don't have to stay here. Go get it. You know, I made more than this. Well, okay, great. So with that whole idea of it, you know, most people get fixated because I, I just love it when somebody tells me what they're worth and not willing to work for less than that. So it's like, okay, and this is the philosophy I've always had about investing in real estate. I would much rather make 50% of something than 100% of nothing. And it's amazing how most people say, 
F that. I'll make nothing. Yeah. All right, well, have a nice day. See, people get fixated on that value of what I'm worth. I'm worth 50% of it. No, okay. If I don't get 50%, I don't want the deal. Then don't do it. Don't do it. You know, what most people don't understand, money follows opportunity. It always does and always will follow opportunity. The problem is most people don't want to do what it takes to make that money to make it work for them. Which, you know, being able to, to, to explain to people and understanding about making money. So if you talk to somebody, it's like, well, how much do you make? Well, I make 20 bucks an hour. No, 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 no. How much do you make? You earn $20 an hour. You don't make $20 an hour. Well, what's the difference? Well, if you don't show up, do you get paid? Nope. Then you don't make it. You earn it because you have to show up to get it. So once you learn that whole idea of how to make money, it works 24-7. Yeah. The whole thing about the, the, the no money down yeah. was actually creating money with no money. Out of it created paper or what equity call, or whatever. Call it phantom money. Yeah. So it's really interesting to, to explain it to people because it's a really tricky way to understand money. Money's a game. And it's so funny because as, as, as early as 22 years old, going to a bank and wanting to do something, they're looking at me like, yeah, no, you can't do that. Okay, well, then tell me how you play your game. Well, this is not a game. This is business. Oh, it's a game. No, it's a game. You just don't understand it's a game. Yeah. You've tricked yourself into thinking this is a real thing that exists and somebody can just make it all up. It's not. But we all made it up. It, that's it. So tell me your rules. So, oh, my rules. No, I was just saying. So well, no, no, yeah, to play the game. Yeah. See, that's, that's what's really funny because if you, if, you, if you take money out of your pocket and invest it, whatever you re get on a monthly basis on that is your rate of return. Yeah. Okay. So if you take $10 or you take $100 and you get $10 a month, your rate of return on that is going to be 10%. Sure. Okay. If you get that month after month after month, that's 120% return on your money. Yep. Okay. So if you lower the money you invest into it and you still maintain the return on it, it the percentage increases. So when you talk to people in general and say, okay, well, if I go like this and give you nothing and I get $10 a month, what's my rate of return? It's infinite. Well, 100%. How do you figure? I didn't give you nothing. Well, it's 100% then. And, it's and, and I don't know if that's an educational thing that people were taught that yeah. or a cultural thing or a belief thing. Because one of the million things is, and this is, this is really an idea for realtors, whatever realtors that are in here. Anytime I talk to a realtor and I'd go up to them and they, well, what are you looking for? I'm looking for bread and butter, three bedroom, two bath. Well, let me show you something. No, no, no. Just give me the list. I'll go look at it. If I'm interested, we'll talk. No, 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 no. I got to show it to you. Why? Why are you going to waste your time doing that? Well, because that's my job. Done. It's not your job. Done. Because what happens is you get realtors that want, well, how much, you, what, what price range are you looking at? Free. How much you want to put down? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Why am I talking to you? <laughs> the stupidity of that is like, well, great. How would you do that? They don't. They want to shut you off. Yeah. When I was in my 20s, I dealt with people in their 40s, and they looked at me as a punk kid not knowing nothing. Yeah. And it's like, you're an idiot. You know? You talk about the apartments. I'm buying the apartments. Yeah. Okay. So we get these apartments up in Apple Valley. Hey, hold on, does anybody, anybody mind if I go another 10 minutes? All right, good. Okay. So here, here I am on a, on, a, on, a, on a Sunday at a birthday party up in Apple Valley, and I'm bored to death. So the guy hands me a newspaper. Hey, you want to read the paper? Sure. So I go through the real estate section, and I see real estate in there, triplexes, duplexes, you know, they're like 30,000 a door. And it's like, what the hell? 30,000 a door? Wow. Well, let's check out the rents. Rents are 300 bucks a month. Shh. Great. Wow. Okay, so I started doing some research, started doing some calls. At the time, this is back in 96. At the time, they had the, uh, 203, two, the 203K investor program yeah. that would allow you to borrow money to fix up the property to get it a, a performing asset. Yeah. Investors screwed that up in six months. They canceled it. <laughs> they did, it's got greedy on it. So anyways, I find out about this five-unit apartment building up in Apple Valley. Little old lady owns it. She's like 75 years old. Her husband had it built 10 years earlier. She has kids that are in their 50s that don't want it. She's got this management company managing it who's the same realtors that are selling it. So this is, again, a lesson that you want to know about investing in real estate. These realtors that I'm dealing with, these guys are in their 40s, and they're, they're like hippie-type guys, you know, with a comb in the back pocket, combing their hair every time they're talking to you, and it's like, okay, dude. He goes, okay, so you want to buy this property? Yeah. Well, it's price, 99000 I say, great. I'll do an, 
uh, AI, uh, an AITD. You guys familiar with that? Wrap all inclusive trust. Wrap around contract. All one, inclusive trustee. One existing escrow. <laughs> Todd, Todd's already said. One S, one one uh, deed of trust. You stack it on top of it, but you put the two together. So it's like two loans combined in one. Well, the one I did it was the loan stayed in the owner's name, and I made the payments on it, but the title went into my name. Banks don't like that. They'll call a note. Not anymore. They depending. Used to. Yeah. Depending. 1996, the highest foreclosure rate in history at the time. Yeah. So they they stopped recording these these foreclosures. So I tell the I, I tell the realtor, okay, well here's what I'll do. I'll make an offer. I'll take over the loan of ninety nine thousand dollars. I had twenty years left on it. I'll give her three thousand dollars down. But I have to make payments on that of two hundred dollars yeah. a month. Okay, whatever. I said once we get the accepted offer, then we'll move forward. So there was another lady that was offering on it too. She was just going to take over the loan, AITD, and that was it. I was going to go off for 3000 I met the lady in the lobby, didn't know who she was. She didn't know who I was. And we talked, and they told her who I was outside. And she said, oh, well, he was kind of fun to talk to. So I go in there, and they say, hey, she accepted your offer. And I said, oh, great. So what do we do now? He goes, well, now we're going to sign the offer. And I said, great. I go, here's what we're going to do. No matter what, no matter what, no matter what, we have to close escrow on the second of the month. Well, why is that important? Don't worry about it. Just close on the second of the month. <laughs> and he's like, Okay. It's kind of stupid. How much money are you going to put down? I said, nothing. Don't play with me on this. And I said, I'm not going to put any money down. Dude. Ha, 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 ha. So I leave. So this is around the 10th of the month that we're doing this signature on this. Okay. So a week goes by. They're calling me up. Hey, there's no money in escrow. Yeah, don't worry about it. It'd be good. No, the week goes by. Hey, there's no money in escrow. What are you doing? You're going to F this thing up. Dude, don't worry about it. So now we, we're getting towards the end of the month, and we're hitting around the 28th of the month. And they go, you need to get your ass up here, and we need to figure this out. And I said, all right. So we go up there, and they're like, okay, well, you're not going to put any money down. I said, no, I'm not going to put any money down. Well, this is bullshit. And I'm going, why is this bullshit? And he says, because you got to put money in this escrow. And I said, okay, well, what do I need to put in the escrow to close escrow? Well, our commission. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, don't worry about it. No, 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 we're going to worry about it because we got to get this settled down right now. And I said, all right, all right, great, great, great. You ready? Yeah. Okay, well, listen real closely because this is the problem most people have. They talk too much and don't listen at all, and they don't see it all. That's the biggest problem because here's what happens. When they sit there and they say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're closing on the second, right? Yeah, I don't know why because when we close on the second, I'm entitled to 28 days' worth of rent. And deposits. And they're like, no, you're not. Uh, yes, yeah, if yeah. I take ownership, proration of rent, they have to prorate that rent. And I go, how much you guys collecting in rent? About twenty two hundred. So about two grand comes to me. Yeah. Can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They said, okay, well that's only two grand. What about the other twenty eight hundred? I said, well you got deposits on hand, right? I'm obligated to give back to those tenants when they move out. Yep. So that's money that's sitting somewhere. Yeah. How much is that? So they look it up, 2500 bucks. Well, that goes in that account too. What's the balance? 300. I guess I'll give you 300 bucks. <laughs> How the fuck do you do that? You wrote it. <laughs> You're too busy doing this. You're not fucking listening to what's going on. <laughs> so when somebody comes up to you and tells you about what they want to do, don't say it can't be done. Just say, well, I don't know how to do that, but maybe you can show me how yeah, to do that. Yeah, why don't you tell me what you want? Most realtors lose deals because they're too, calm, too caught up and I'm the realtor, you're an idiot. It's got to be on this car form and go this certain way. And if it doesn't follow what I'm used to, I'm done. I bought that property when I was like 27 years old. And they looked at me as a punk kid, not knowing my ass from the hole in the ground. And afterwards, well, they're probably still broke today. They're probably still are. Yeah. I think I ran into a guy like a while ago that was in his 60s and he, he had done the, I had already sold homes, I've been here forever, yada, yada. Oh, I just lost all again. I'm starting over. He's in his 60s. Never bought anything. Sold them all to investors. But they're all the same. No, and, and, that's, and that's one of the biggest things that, you know, if somebody has an idea or a concept, listen to it. Don't shut it down. If you don't know, you don't know. And just say you don't know. It's funny. I'll get with people, and I'll tell you, I'm the biggest idiot you'll ever meet. I walk in a room. I'm the dumbest guy in the room. I'm, I'm going to learn from anybody and everybody in the room. I mean, I'll agree with that on multiple levels, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> but that's what's really funny. Most people walk in the room, and they want to be known as the smartest guy in the room. It's like, you're an idiot. The problem is you just don't know you're an idiot. Well, you get, you get two choices. <laughs> you get to be perceived as intelligent or people like you, but you don't get both. Exactly, exactly. So that's one of the biggest things, like for me. I dress like this. Most of the time I'm full of dirt or oil. I mean, I work on my equipment. 
Yeah. Do I have to? No. no. Do I have to work? No. But I enjoy doing it, so I do it. Simple as that. Simple as that. So build a clubhouse. Build a clubhouse. Just 3,000 square foot clubhouse. <laughs> so with In that, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up the interview. Guys, thank Chuck for coming out. Give a round of applause.